Hi, everybody. On the heels of having yesterday one of the original honey badgers in academia, Janice Fiamingo, who also hails from Canada. Today, I have a new entrant into the world of honey badgerhood. Today, we have Professor Dorian Abbott, who is a geophysicist at uh, the University of Chicago. Welcome, Dorian. How are you doing? Great. Thanks. And actually, my grandparents lived on an island in Nova Scotia when I was a kid. So, so you could claim some Canadian heritage. And uh, some of my ancestors were from Nova Scotia. Because nah, I often get one of the one of the frequent questions I get whenever I appear on a show is, is there something in the Canadian water? And usually it refers to the fact that Jordan Peterson and Gad Saad are Canadian. And I say, <laughs> I don't, I think it's just the, the random serendipity of life that caused it. But, but maybe, who knows, maybe there is something in the Canadian ethos that makes us, because we're supposed to be the nice, quiet guys. But then again, I am from the Middle East, so I don't think you you can take me out of the Middle East, but you can't take the Middle East out of me, as they say. Okay, so Dorian, uh, we'll talk eventually about uh, what happened with you at MIT, but I thought we can maybe first get into some uh, nerd uh, stuff. Uh, right. You Your background is in mathematics. Your undergrad, master's, and PhD were in mathematics, correct? Well, actually, undergrad was in physics. Okay. And Masters and PhD were in applied mathematics, so the real mathematicians wouldn't include me in their club. <laughs> oh, it's interesting that you say this because I so I did an undergrad in mathematics uh, and computer science, and in a few cases we would have some courses where we had the engineering students with us. And as happens everywhere in life, where people create these, you know, annoying hierarchies. The math students would kind of look at the engineering students as, oh, those cute little guys who can't really handle the theoretical stuff. That's why they are applied. So I guess you are intimating something similar, right? That you're an applied mathematician, not, you know, you're not the number theorist. Yeah. So the sort of stuff that I worked on was like numerical methods and partial differential equations and algorithms and things, which are very, very applied compared to what the real math guys do. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was uh, an undergrad, there was actually a student, but he, he's, he's certainly much older than you uh, when he was at Harvard. I think he got his PhD at Harvard. So within the math cohorts, you know, everybody is obviously a very good student, is probably pretty high on IQ and so on. But even within any group, you have someone who is ahead of everybody else. And so there was this one student uh, who is now who is now a well-known number theorist at McGill University. So he was part of our cohorts, but he he wasn't in math and computer science. He was just in honors math. And apparently, the legend about him was, and because you mentioned partial differential equations, that we had this very tough differential equations course. And you know everybody would be working on these you know problem sets. You know you get those assignments every two weeks where you have to work on these. And you know I'm sitting there you know for a week trying to crack each of these problems. And then this guy apparently would walk into class. Someone would remind him that the oh the assignments due today. Oh no, he would pull out the thing and then he would kind of answer the whole thing within the class period time, which each of us was taking two weeks to answer. And that guy eventually became one of the proofreaders of the. Theorem, uh, you know, Fermat's last theorem by was it Andrew Wiles? I think is that was that his name? Yeah, yeah. And so he had received. So the guy's name, by the way, I'll mention his name. Maybe he'll be happy to hear his name on the show. His name is Rene Darmon, D A R, uh, or maybe that was his dad's name, who was also a professor. But in any case, Darmon. Does that ring a bell? D A R M O N. No, yeah, no, I don't know. That's not from your world. And no. so, so anyway, so that guy was one of the people that Wiles sent his proof to. Uh, oh. To make sure that it was so quite a historical thing. Okay, so why don't you tell us a bit about what you do in math, keeping it to the lay people. Give us a sense of what it is that uh, gets you excited in terms of your science. Sure, yeah. Just one thing that, that your your story brought up was some of the people like that at, at Harvard when I was an undergrad didn't end up staying in the field, which I thought was sort of interesting. And I think part of it is if you never, you know, like doing actual research requires serious hard work, <laughs> even if you're brilliant. And so if you don't get used to that early, it might actually make it harder to make it farther in the field. Well, it's interesting that you say this because I, not that I want to be plugging all these other people's work, but why not plug colleagues? I'm reading this book currently by Angela Duxworth and the book is, she's a psychologist who studied uh, grit and perseverance yeah. because it's actually relevant for one of the chapters of my next book. 
And in it, she's arguing that, you know, we often kind of romanticize the idea that this person has innate talents, right? He, you know, this person, mathematics comes easy to them. But in her research, she has found that uh, it is just as important, if not more so, exactly to your point, that you have to have grit and perseverance. Innate talent is only going to carry you so far, right? Yeah, but uh, does she examine whether grit is an innate talent? Oh, right. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure what the, uh, you know, uh, nature, nurture, you know, metric on grit is. I think that generally speaking, so this is not specific to grit. I think for most personality traits, I hope I'm not botching this up. It's somewhere between 30 to 80 percent of the variance is explained uh, through heritable factors. But across all traits, it's about 50 percent. So if I were to be conservative, I would probably say that there's certainly at least 50% of the variance of grit that comes from, uh, you know, innate forces. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's just an important thing to remember, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Okay, so tell us a bit about uh, some of the math stuff that interests you. Again, keeping in mind that we're not all mathematicians. Yeah, let me tell you what I'm really excited about right now. So I work with a mathematician at NYU named John Weir. And we work on rare event sampling. And typically the way our collaboration works is he develops new mathematical techniques and I think of ways to apply them. And so one thing we worked on recently, it relates to planetary dynamics. And so we have a code that can integrate, for example, the solar system and includes Newton's gravity. It includes uh, Einstein's gravity and it can integrate it forward in time. And then we asked the question, you know, how often does Mercury's orbit become unstable? So in other words, like mechanistically, does Jupiter and Venus, do the gravitational perturbations of Jupiter and Venus pump up Mercury's eccentricity until it either intersects with Venus or nearly intersects with Venus and, and gets scattered into the sun or another planet? And so it turns out if you run the solar system forward for 5 billion years, that happens about 1% of the time which is kind of interesting, right? Like, you know, it seems our solar system is only only sort of quasi stable. It was a surprise for people to realize that it's actually chaotic. It's it's, uh, not deterministic on long time scales, but it's also not really stable, which is kind of interesting. It's sort of semi-stable. Okay, so that people had established. So if you want to do that, it takes a supercomputer and it's really expensive to do these calculations. And so maybe each one takes a month and you maybe have to do 1,000 or 2,000 to get an accurate estimate of this probability. So you need 1,000 CPUs or 2,000 running for a month or so. But then what if you want to evaluate it at a more, uh, a sooner time? So we pick 2 billion years. You know, what if you want to know at 2 billion years what's the probability of Mercury going unstable? It's a much lower probability. So you have to use uh, a more fancy technique than just running a bunch of these simulations because you'd have to run so many that we don't have access to a supercomputer that can do that. Now, someone does, like the people doing nuclear test simulations have access to that computer, but they don't give it to bozos worrying about, you know, Mercury <laughs> becoming unstable. So what we did was we use a splitting and killing algorithm. So we figure out what's called a reaction coordinate that is a proxy for the probability that this rare event happens. It's not the actual probability, but it's a proxy that we can calculate using statistics that are available to us. And then as that reaction coordinate progresses more towards the event, and we have simulations going along, we stop them and we split multiple simulations of them. And then as if if you're not progressing towards the event, we kill those so that we always maintain the same total number of simulations, but we're progressively weighting the simulation ensemble towards simulations that proceed to the event of interest. And so the way we do that, so suppose we kill one, uh, now an adjacent simulation gets its probability. And if we split one into two, each uh, child gets half the probability. And so we always have the probability tracked. So we can do this in a way that we can later figure out what the probability of the event is, even though we've torqued the system. Is it, so when you're doing that, uh, what do you call it, splitting and killing? Yes, yeah, splitting uh, and killing. So is... Are you doing the killing part because you're you're trying to reduce the computational load that would otherwise be too too great for you to go down the entire path? Is that what's happening? Yeah, yeah let me back up for a second. So uh, if you do a direct numerical simulation ensemble and you're trying, to, it, what, what you end up getting a really good estimate of is the mean behavior. 
because most of the ensemble is around the mean. But we want something way in the tail. So we're finding a way to bias the model to be simulating the tail of the distribution rather than the mean of the distribution. So we'll use all our computational effort on the tail of the distribution, but we do it in a way that we can unpack and recover the original probabilities. Got you. I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to link whatever you just told me to some of the stuff from my far far memory. And so it it it's reminding me of when I had taken an artificial intelligence course where we had to uh, model the search space for you know for example when you think about chess the search space for the entire decision tree of chess if you were to do the entire you know exhaustive search would take longer than than the existence of the universe so therefore what you have to do is you have to do uh, like a, a, a i think it was the the algorithm that we used was called alpha beta pruning where you have to kind of prune the search tree so that the tree that's this big and is completely impossible to tackle computationally you could say well i can cut off this whole part of the tree i don't need to go down this anymore and that then makes the 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 search algorithm that much more feasible is it is there an analogy between what I just said and what you were talking about? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's similar. And in that case, the reaction coordinate would be something like the optimal move. And yeah, so you're okay. trying to find ways to get towards the optimal yeah, move. Yeah, yeah. And then just the bottom line of this research was we found that the probability of mercury going unstable in the next 2 billion years is about 1 in 10,000. And in order to evaluate the probability with the accuracy that we did would have required 100,000 simulations uh, with just a direct numerical simulation, and we did it with a thousand simulations, so we sped up by a factor of a hundred. So, what is the key uh, insight from that research? Is it the 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 mathematical approach that allowed you to take it from whatever it was you said ten thousand to one thousand, or is it the actual substantive contact uh, content of your mercury result? Well, so for that particular research, we were showing that this method can work in the in the planetary dynamics case. Okay. And so that was the main contribution. It's also interesting that we were able to obtain this estimate, although we're now working with other planetary dynamics estimates, which neither John or experts, which neither John or I are. And we're trying to really nail down the actual probability, which is kind of interesting to people. One thing I should mention is that the, the solar system is predictable for tens of millions of years. So we know that Mercury is not going to go unstable in, you know, in the next 30 million years. <laughs> so don't worry. Right? Okay, so I'm, I can sleep well at night. Yeah, you could sleep well at night. You know, you don't have to hide under your desk. Because this way, I was just going to say, don't don't give me new reasons to hide under the desk. I just came out, man. We just got rid of Trump and, we, and there wasn't a nuclear holocaust like Sam Harris warned us. So I'm feeling safe now and now you're making me feel a bit unsafe, but okay. Yeah. And so, but anyways, but the other interesting thing is now that we've demonstrated for the first time that these techniques can be applied in planetary dynamics, we can do lots of different situations. There's lots of exoplanet configurations where you're interested in a rare event. And then for planetary defense, it could be useful. So for example, suppose we discover a new asteroid and we want to evaluate the probability that it hits Earth. Uh, some of these asteroids, if it's big enough, a small probability is relevant. You care if it's 10 to the minus six or 10 to the minus three. So we could evaluate that. And then we actually have other techniques that we can use to calculate optimal perturbations to cause something to happen or not happening. And so, for example, we could take an asteroid that is on an Earth path and we can calculate the optimal time and amount of perturbation to cause it to deviate. Uh, or one that's not on Earth path, we could cause it to hit Earth. You know, in theory, oh. we could make those calculations. So those are the sorts of things like that might make this kind of research useful. It's an example of blue sky research that eventually could become useful. How, how uh, because you mentioned rare events, so then again, I'm, I'm, I, I have a very synthetic mind. I'm always trying to create consilience, right? Unity of knowledge between many different possible yeah. fields. So how does your rare event stuff link to say, a good friend of mine, fellow Lebanese, Nassim Talib, when he talks about, you know, the black swan, is, 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 is your, a uh, rare event, a manifestation of the black swan at the cosmological level? Is that what's happening? Well, here's what I would say. So uh, uh, I think in Talib's schema, a white swan is something that in theory you could predict and a black swan is something that you couldn't predict. Is that how it works? I mean, I'm not sure I'll have to uh, some, uh, revise my stuff, but go ahead. So the, the way this... Uh, 
the way this rare event simulation works, we need a, a numerical model that's faithful. So we need a model that can produce the correct results for a rare event. It just would take too long to run it uh, because all we're doing is tricking the model into producing what we want. If it's a true black swan, something that we know so, so little about, we can't even put it in our model. So you can't then, predict it. Yeah, then we yeah, can't yeah, predict it using this method. Yeah, yeah. I, that I makes think sense. that's what I would say. So it can predict a rare event that we have a good understanding of and we can formulate a mathematical model that can capture it. But if it's something that's a total surprise, it won't be able to help with that. Yeah, I'm trying to think now. So uh, in, 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 again, in my past life, I also studied operations research, which is you know, a real, real manifestation of applied mathematics, right? Where you're trying, you know, you're trying to, I mean, I guess you're familiar with operations research, right? Yes, of course. Not, a, not in detail, but just a little bit. So operations research is the field whereby you're trying to solve algorithmically problems in nature, or let's say I'm, I'm housed in the business school, uh, problems in the business school where they're optimization problems. You're trying to minimize something or you're trying to maximize something. So the traveling salesman problem is uh, a problem whereby you have a salesman that has to go visit uh, 30 cities one time each and return to the starting point. How should he or she visit those 30 cities as to minimize the distance travel or minimize uh, gas costs or whatever? Some cases, problems are optimization problems, uh, a maximization problem. Sometimes they're minimized. So it, it's impossible to manually solve these problems once the problem becomes big. So you have to solve it algorithmically. And so operations research is really a beautiful field, at least that I think most all business school students should take, although most of them try to stay away from the more mathematical courses. So they end up taking the fuzzy wuzzy courses, how to motivate your employee, which is something that you either know how to do or not. You don't need to take a course at the MBA level. Uh, so I just thought that I was trying to link some of the stuff that I've learned. with. So you, you do deal, I guess, with optimization yeah. problems in the grand sense of the term. Yeah, two, two things about that, a science thing and a silly story. So right. the, the science thing is the, the problem I mentioned about trying to guide uh, asteroids, that's it's an optimization problem. Okay. And so we have uh, a functional that we're trying to minimize. In this case, it would, be, it would involve a final cost, which would be the final cost would be not hitting Earth. So, and then there's another cost, which is the size of the perturbation. We want to minimize our perturbations. And then we would have a model that could be run forwards and backwards, an adjoint model that can that is a linear version of the forward model that can be run backwards. Okay. And it's going to search through uh, trajectory space, and it's going to find uh, the path that minimizes that functional. So that's that's how that works. So it sounds similar to the operations research. Oh, very nice. And you said you had a silly example. Yeah, the silly example, the silly story is when I was a grad student with two other grad students, we rented an apartment. And we get there to sign the thing, and the land the landowner is like, "You guys are grad students at Harvard, right?" And we're like, "Yeah." And he said, "But you're not in the business school, are you?" <laughs> <laughs> we said, "No, science." He said, "Okay, that's fine. I'll rent to you." Because oh, you don't want to rent to business school. Why? Because apparently, apparently, there's a, they have a bad reputation with landlords in the Cambridge Somerville area. <laughs> Interesting. I, I want I I want to know more. I came very close actually to landing the. Harvard Business School assistant professorship straight out of my PhD. I was one of the final candidates, made it all the way to a campus visit. There's kind of a whole triage process. And from the rumor that I had heard at the time uh, that I, so this is now about 1993, I hadn't gotten it because it turns out that I don't ovulate. And so that was held against me. And there was nothing I can do about that on my CV. So, so the diversity, inclusion, and equity stuff goes back all the way to 1993. But you didn't realize then that you could have identified. Exactly right. Had I known, my God, I would have been making tons more money than I ended up making at lowly Concordia. All right. Uh, anything else we want to talk about? Your sign? Are you able to comment at all about, and maybe you're not, maybe I'm not sure, about the, the climate science issues? Is that within your wheelhouse? Yeah. Uh, I actually teach a course on oh. global warming. <laughs> okay. And so let me give you my, so I have an essay that anyone can look up. It's called Conservation is Conservative, okay. where I, that's sort of my, my uh, attempt to make a convincing argument to people who identify politically as conservative, uh, that it's reasonable to do something about global warming. So here's my, my short argument, just starting from the data. So we know that the global mean temperature has increased 
by about 1.2 degrees Celsius in the last 170 years. And, and that's just from people putting out thermometers and writing down what the temperature was. So w nobody seriously debates that. We also know that the, t the CO2 has increased by about 50%. So uh, it's, it's a molecule that is at a low concentration, but uh, if you take a greenhouse gas and change its concentration, it still can impact the radiative forcing. So it's increased from about 280 parts per million to about 415 now. We know that directly from measurements on, uh, on Hawaii, Mauna Laua, or I think I got that right, volcano, where you just go out and you take the measurement uh, of what's in the air. Uh, and then for, from about 1958, and before that, we know from ice cores. And so in 1958, it was about 315 parts per million. So most of the increase has been directly tracked, but we have ice cores before that where little bubbles of air are trapped in the ice. So those are two things we know. And from a basic physics per perspective, we know that an increase in uh, temperature of about one-ish degree should result from about that increase in CO2. And so the whole story is consistent with the CO2 increase caused the temperature increase. Uh, that, that's what we know for sure. The question of what will happen in the future is more uncertain. The main reason is we have a poor ability to model clouds in the future. And so the, the impact of global warming depends strongly on how clouds respond to the changing climate. If the clouds end up responding so that, for example, they reflect less sunlight, there'll be more warming. If this cloud responds so that, uh, so that they reflect more sunlight, there'll be less warming. And so that's, that's the basis for the scientific uncertainty. And the reason that it's hard to know what the clouds will do is that the models that are being used have a grid size of about 100 kilometers by 100 kilometers. But the clouds have a size of 100 meters to a kilometer. And so they're not large enough to be resolved by the models. So and they're, so, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish your point. Well, so they're subgrid scale and you have to use some parameterization that's usually theoretically motivated and empirically tuned, but they deviate, the models deviate in the future because of this. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna, so, uh, and uh, allow me just a few minutes to set it up because you probably have never heard of this before because I want to take this epistemological tool that I use in my work and see if I can apply it to the climate science uh, debate. Yeah. So one of the things that I talk about in chapter seven of The Parasitic Mind, uh, the chapter is, is, is on how to seek truth. And I argue for something uh, that, called, uh, that I call nomological networks of cumulative evidence. Uh, this is not a meta-analysis. This is not a literature review. It's a completely different epistemological way of amassing evidence in support of an argument. So, for example, if I want to prove to you, Dorian, that toy preferences are not socially constructed, that there's a biological basis for why boys prefer certain toys and girls prefer other toys, what would be the distinct lines of evidence that I would need to provide you so that I can drown you, forgive the pun given that we're talking about climate change, that I can drown you in a tsunami of evidence? So here's how I would go about it. I can get you data from developmental psychology that shows that children who are too young to be socialized, meaning they couldn't have learned those toy preferences, already exhibit the sex-specific toy preferences. So already that one line of evidence is enough to nail the fatal, uh, you know, the, the, the coffin on the nail, whatever the expression is. Uh, but I'm going to give you much more in data. So now I can get you data from comparative psychology where we compare across species. And I can show you that vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees exhibit the same sex specificity of toy preferences that humans do. Now, this is starting to look pretty promising. Now, I'm, but I'm not going to stop there. That's why it's called a nomological network of cumulative evidence. I can get you data from pediatric endocrinology whereby I show you that little girls who suffer from an endocrinological disorder called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which masculinizes their behavior and their morphology, girls who suffer from that disorder have a reversal of their toy preferences. Their toy preferences become akin to those of little boys. I can get you data from ancient Greece looking at a content analysis of funerary monuments showing you that depictions of children are shown playing with the exact same toys that we have today. I could get you cross-cultural data from indigenous societies that are very non-Western and they exhibit the same toy preferences. So you see how bit by bit I'm getting you data 
from across cultures, across disciplines, across species, across time periods, all of which, are, are, imagine it's an epistemological triangulation method. So now I'm going to, so now I, I you, you follow what I'm saying, correct? We're good? Okay. So now I want to take this epistemological tool and I want to see if I could apply a nomological networks approach to climate science debate. So that if I build you different boxes, each of these boxes represent distinct lines of evidence. You, you gave me two metrics, the, yeah. okay? But I, I want much more. I want a I want hundred different metrics from completely different time periods, different disciplines, different methodologies. Do we have such a nomological network for climate change that says, look, I've got this ultra steroid nomological network. Nobody can contest that. Or my intuition is, we're very far from that nomological network. So it's very reasonable for perfectly sane, normal people to say, I don't buy a lot of the bullshit. Where are we? Well, so that's what the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change attempts to do. So they go, they look at paleoclimate, they look at lots of different models, they look at, uh, you know, paleoclimate on different time scales, and they attempt to do this. So that that's where I would look. I, I, I don't know that whole document. It's like, 500 pages off the top of my head, but that's what they're attempting to do. I gave you the summary of what I think are the strongest points. And the reason is a lot of that paleoclimate stuff, I've worked in the field of paleoclimate and it can be a little fuzzy. Uh, you know, you're trying to reconstruct the climate from long, long ago. It's hard enough to do the temperature, but then it turns out that the, estimating what the CO2 was is even harder. And then there are other things that it can affect climate other than CO2. So it can get very hard to infer the climate sensitivity. But that's the, the, the nomological, neurological network, what is it called? <laughs> nomological network of cumulative evidence. Nomological network of cumulative evidence. I mean, that's roughly what they're trying to do in the IPCC. What I would say is, what I just told you is really beyond doubt, that uh, the climate has changed, that the CO2 has increased, and that the cause of the climate change was the CO2 increase. What will happen in the future is, is, uh, is less certain, and what humans should do about it is not my department. And so those are the points where there's more space for debate. And so, I mean, when people ask me what, what we should do about climate change, it's, it's kind of like, I don't feel like I'm the right person to answer that question. You know, I don't know if we should do a cap and trade or a carbon tax or like uh, the guy from Denmark says, just basically do nothing. Right. You know, oh, yes. I know who you're talking about. There's other people who yeah. are supposed to be making those decisions, but my job is to say what we know about the science. That's okay, so I'm let me. I want to summarize what you just said because I think I intuitively, as someone who's not well versed in that literature in, in the least bit, this is what my intuition was, and I think it perfectly jives with what you said. Point one: there are certain markers of climate change that we can ascribe to, you know, being man man caused, human caused, and that we could tick off as true. Trying to predict forward where we're going to be is completely fuzzy and no one worth their salt can say anything to that effect with any sort of certainty. And number three, perfectly reasonable people can have very valid debates as to how much we should be spending to reduce some metric by some amount. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That's a mostly fair assessment. The only thing I would modify is point two. It's not like People are, you know, it's not like you have monkeys throwing darts at the dartboard. You know, we do have computational models that uh, that are fairly sophisticated that attempt to predict future climate. And we have some estimate of, you know, the highest probability scenarios. It's just that it's not that certain. You know, there's a range of estimates. And what I would caution against is sometimes there'll be people described as climate skeptics, you know, I, I don't want to use any of these words, but there will be people who are sometimes described as climate skeptics who will argue for uh, a small climate sensitivity, which is a measure of the temperature change as you increase the CO2. Uh, and what I think that's an example of is underestimating. So they argue for a data for a, a data point that's within the range of uncertainty, but I think they underestimate the uncertainty. They're squishing the uncertainty down and saying, I know it's going to be this small value. Whereas I think a more accurate thing to say is it could be that small value, but it could also be a high value. And right. actually, that, you know, they're both within our uncertainty, which is part of my argument in the conservation is conservative article that, you know, if you have a conservative disposition, 
you might not want to risk it in a situation like that. Got you. Uh, it'd be great if you send me a link to that and I could put it in the description section. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. Okay, let's try to see if we could apply our uh, collective uh, mental power. Uh, and by that, I mean, you just answer and I'll just ask the question. Uh, uh, how, where do you, how do you think we're doing, uh, whether it be in terms of mathematical modeling, whether it be in terms of applying the scientific method to the public policy interventions related to COVID? Are you willing to comment on this? I just, I don't feel like I know enough to, to really know. I mean, uh, that's something that just requires so much. So here, here's all I would say is I feel like that conversation requires a lot of expertise. And I worry that uh, too much emphasis has been given to the public health officials and not enough to those with other expertise. Right. And that's that's really all I all I can say about it. Not being an expert in public health or economics or mental health or any of the other issues that could be relevant here. Well, I mean, the way that I would reframe what you just said using a operations uh, research parlance language would be that when you are trying to, uh, you know, solve, uh, maximize, or minimize an objective function, that objective function is subject to certain constraints. And that objective function might require the simultaneous maximization and minimization of multiple variables rather yep. than a single variable. And one of the things that I've talked about, and, and I'm hardly someone who's read every single paper on COVID, uh, but you know, given whatever knowledge I have in my head, it struck me as a bit suspect of how people were tackling the grand debate over uh, COVID. So for example, if all you care about is reducing the number of deaths due to COVID, that's going to be a very small slice of the bigger optimization problem, which speaks to your point when you said we didn't speak to the economics people and we didn't speak, right? Life is trade-offs, right? Economics is the study of trade-offs, right? It's opportunity cost versus this. So, so my feeling is, and I'm just as much of a layman when it comes to COVID as you are, is that I'm willing to bet that the public policy people would have received an F had they been in your class. Uh, well, you know, in my class, I, you know, it's pretty hard to get an F in my global warming class. <laughs> you have to really work <laughs> at it. <laughs> That's the state of higher education these yeah, days. Yes. So they probably they might have gotten a B minus. <laughs> OK. Oh, so are you so you you are a uh, a uh, participant in the grotesque and orgiastic grade inflation? Is that what you're uh, admitting to on uh, camera? Dr. Abbott? Uh, you know, here's how I would put it. I'm teaching a core, a large core class. The point is to uh, help people who are non-scientists get to a basic level of quantitative, uh, you know, literacy. Uh, it turns out that in my class, the students coming in have a range in quantitative literacy from essentially zero to like econ students who can do partial differential equations like nothing. They have to take my class too because they have to do physical science. So it's a really it's really hard to tune that level to try mm. to get everyone through. It, it turns out that a lot of people get A's in that class. Oh boy, oh boy. Because I set it up, it's all set up. So it's, you know, it's set up in advance and I say, here are the objectives, here's what I want you to know, here's how you'll be tested. And if the students are able to get through it all and do it, I don't grade on a curve. It's, did they hit they, the objective? Got it. Uh, all right. Sorry, did, did you finish your point? So there you go. Yeah, that's it. So that's that's how I would respond to that. <laughs> All right, let's talk a few more uh, geek stuff, and then we'll get into some of the woke stuff. Uh, although these these can certainly intersect also. Uh, natural versus social sciences. One of the things that really upsets me from some of the uh, Dunning Kruger types on social media, the ones who uh, are very haughty ab about how idiotic they are and self assured about how idiotic they are is that they will often, you know, write to say things like, oh, but okay, Professor Saad, you study evolution psychology. Okay, well, that's a pseudoscience. Oh, you study uh, psychology of decision-making, but that's not real science. Oh, you said, well, you know, you picked it, right? Just, just like earlier you said, applied mathematicians feel that the pure, right? So there's always an opportunity for some Cretan to engage in tribal, uh, you know, thinking. And what upsets me about the natural versus social sciences dichotomy is that uh, I'm the first to admit that one of the things that the social sciences suffer from is the fact that unlike the natural sciences, 
that operate within consilient. Consilient, in case you, you, you're un, unaware, Dorian, is a term that was reintroduced into the lexicon by E.O. Wilson, the Harvard biologist, when he wrote a book in the late 90s called Consilience, which is unity of knowledge. So physics is consilient be, more than sociology, not because sociology is less epistemologically scientific than physics. Many people would argue it's a lot more difficult to study sociology than it is to study physics. Auguste Comte, the famous sociologist, when he created his hierarchy of sciences, he was a sociologist, put sociology at the, at the apex because it's a lot harder to study things like social systems and, and, and our brains than it is to study the uh, you know carbon dating, whatever, Okay, what, which is much more deterministic. Okay, But the problem with the social sciences is that we don't have an accepted core knowledge. So in, in chemistry, you don't have chemists for the periodic table and chemists against the periodic table. So you have a core knowledge, which is only provisionally true, right? In 300 years, we might decide that whatever we thought was true today is no longer true true that's what's beautiful about science but at any given point physicists have replicated something in 17 different ways have agreed that this is true and then they could move on with the assuredness that that's part of core knowledge that doesn't happen in the social sciences because number one uh social sciences fa fail in terms of the replication paradigm right there are countless findings that have less than five percent replication that's not a very good thing and also, I think it's because in the social sciences, you're much less likely to always adhere to the scientific method. You allow, hence the parasitic mind, you allow idea pathogens to parasitize your ability to stay true to the scientific method. So it's not that psychology, the study of human nature, is any less scientific than the study of the Big Bang. It's just that uh, physicists are much more likely to be... Uh, inoculated against activist ideas because they are more strongly supporters of the scientific method. What do you think of this analysis? Or do you think actually that some fields are inherently more quote, sciency than others? Well, so let me, I have a few things that I thought about while you were talking. The first is E.O. Wilson is, a, my grandfather is a huge fan of E.O. Wilson and reads all his books. He's 90. And he's actually an inventor and he's still inventing. And, you know, he calls me up almost every week and we talk about what he's working on. But he calls him the Ant-Man. He is the Ant-Man. But E.O. Wilson, listen, he's still alive. You could tell your granddad, one of the guys that I would love to have on my show, I, I'm always stepping to contact him because I'm always worried that, you know, maybe he's too old to want to do these things. Maybe I'm being ageist here. But it truly is would be a fantasy for me to have him on because I think he's a historical figure. So I share your grandfather's fanhood of him. And then my favorite quote from E.O. Wilson is communism. Great idea. Wrong species. Hey, wait a minute. You stole that from me. I, you no, you no, no, use no, that? I, yeah, yeah. I, I don't mean stole it in that it's my quote. I mean that that's one of my favorite quotes. It's actually in the parasitic mind. Oh, wow. Because, I should read the parasitic mind. Sorry to admit, I, I haven't read it yet. Well, that, by the way, demonstrates that you can't be a very serious scholar. If you're speaking to Gad Saad, author of The Parasitic Mind, and you come on the show and you haven't read The Parasitic Mind, you need to be hiding under your repentance desk for probably a month. <laughs> okay, I will. I will. Anyways, go on. Yeah, yeah, fantastic quote. That's exactly right. Whenever I'm told, Whenever I'm told questions, whenever I'm asked things like, well, why is it important to study and understand human nature? I usually exactly turn to that quote because I say there are downstream consequences to having an erroneous view of human nature. So take, for example, trying to impose a political and economic system that is antithetical to human nature. Boom, cue the E.O. Wilson quote. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. OK, so then the other thing. So let me give you an example of why physical scientists sometimes get frustrated with social scientists. It's yeah. it's econ example. So with the economic downturn, uh, what they call now the Great Recession, I guess, like uh, 12 years ago or whatever yeah. this was, I remember that they were, you know, they were talking about whether the government was going to infuse a ton of money into the system. And I, when they said this, I was really excited because I was like, okay, you got these Keynesian guys that say that the government can push a bunch of money into the system when it's not working well and that'll fix things. 
And you've got these anti-Keynesian guys who say that doesn't work. You've got to just like let things, you know, I, obviously I'm not an economist, but the, yeah. I, my understanding was there was this division. I said, okay, we're going to have an experiment and we're going to find out if it works or not. But the problem was after they did this, everybody just had their own, stuck with their view and interpreted the evidence based on their view. And so I found it frustrating that you couldn't set up experiments to actually settle questions that you, you can just have these forever arguments. Uh, so can I, can I weigh in on this? Yeah. I think that simply speaks to them not having applied the scientific method as it should be applied to be able to adjudicate which of the positions is correct, right? But there is nothing epistemologically less sciency about studying the human condition. I mean, what could be more important scientifically than studying why we experience romantic jealousy or murderous rage or, right? I mean, we, we're not going to turn to physicists to study the human condition. So once we agree that the human condition is within the purview, within the rubric of science, what makes it then sciency or not is whether you are a dogged uh, implementer of the unbiased epistemology of the scientific method. So the example that you gave me with the economist is simply saying to me that irrespective of what the evidence would have been, I'm going to stick to my ideological starting point. Hence, I am failing in my unbiased scientific approach. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Uh, and I agree in general. The only thing qualification I would add is I feel that there are some issues when studying the human condition that might not be amenable to the scientific methodology, uh, things related to experiences, uh, et cetera. Do you really, like, can, you, can, you, can, you give, can you be more specific or you can't think of off the top of your head? Well, I'm, I'm wondering whether, whether you could use, uh, I mean, you, you couldn't use the scientific methodology to say how God saw it experience the birth of his children, right? No, I can't do necessarily Gatsad, but I can say, for example, that uh, when a parent uh, experiences the birth of his child, they will have an increase of release of this hormone more so than if they see the, the, the birth of a random child that is not theirs. And the reason why th that endocrinological response system is different when I see my child to that other child is because of these evolutionary reasons. So, uh, so it depends what is the question you ask, right? I mean, I can't scientifically say why you and your wife fell in love, but I can say that the likelihood that you are birds of a feather flock together is greater than if opposites attract because the science supports that premise. Does, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I follow 100%. I would, uh, it's just that you, originally you set it up as the human experience. And it seems that there are some things ab about the human experience that might not be amenable to the scientific method, including people's actual experiences. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, maybe at the individual level, but at, as an aggregate, it's kind of like, and, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm vulgarizing it too much here, but uh, there's a common cognitive bias that you get with uh, people who despise evolutionary psychology. And it's, it, it's, a, it's a bias of statistical reasoning. So for example, if I walk into class and I say, it is absolutely true that there is an evolved sexual dimorphism such that within the human species, men are bigger than women. And then some imbecile will raise their hand in the audience and say, but Professor Saad, my Aunt Laura is taller than my Uncle Joe. Oh shit, Darwin is dead. Let's go back to the drawing board, right? So a single datum doesn't, I mean, obviously you know this, but I'm saying it for our viewers, a single datum doesn't falsify a statement that is true at the population level. So uh, my inability to necessarily offer a scientific explanation for individual heterogeneity, why Dorian likes to fish more than he likes to go uh, play pinball, uh, that may not be possible because I don't know what are the re random genetic combination that make Dorian, that makes him love fishing more than, uh, you know, whatever. But at the aggregate level, there are absolutely clear statements that I could make about the human. So let me give you an example, right? I mean, because people always say evolutionary psychology is all unfalsifiable bullshit, which I mean, it is actually the exact opposite that's true about evolutionary theory, precisely because the onus is on us when we are arguing that something is an adaptation to build the requisite nomological network. So if anything, the evidentiary threshold that we seek to, to reach before we, are, we, we definitively say that something is an adaptation is probably higher than all the other sciences. 
But the reason why people think that it is kind of post hoc storytelling, it's because you are explaining a phenomenon that occurred distally, right? So, so for example, I could then argue, well, astrophysicists are not real scientists because, you know, they weren't there when the Big Bang happened. They're yeah, just... Yeah. Right? So I think it's a cognitive bias that causes... And actually, one of my doctoral students, one of my current doctoral students is studying these issues for his dissertation, specifically the idea that you can take the exact same, uh, for example, we could take mathematical models, the exact same mathematical model. If I give you a description where I tell you this is being used in climate science, or I give you the exact same mathematical model and I tell you this is being used to study consumer choice, even though it's the exact same epistemology, same mathematical model, same everything, people will ascribe higher science score to the climate science because that feels like I'm wearing a white lab coat. It feels yeah. sciencey. But when I apply the exact same methodology, epistemology, everything is the same, but it says consumer, that just feels commercial. It feels fake. You follow? Yeah, yeah I follow. I guess what I would say is it might be interesting for you to talk to someone who works on the philosophy of the mind and these qualia, these they, what they call qualia, you know, these experiences, because I think there is, you know, these people would argue that there is a uh, what they would call a category error of thinking that you could use science to explain qualia. And so I, I can't yeah. represent their position fully, but it yeah. might be interesting to you to see what you mean. But then in general, I totally agree with you. We shouldn't be dismissive of the social sciences and this issue of uh, dismissing evolutionary psychology is silly. And I think often it comes from a sort of straw manning of evolutionary yes, psychology yes. and and seeing, you know, like journalists use it and stuff. And there it is a just so story, yeah. but not realizing that there's actually serious people who think about this stuff and, and can do it in a rigorous way. Yeah. And I, I think what bothers me, and, and I think that's just the my personhood, I take personal offense to these kinds of attitudes, is when someone who literally is kind of a video game Joe playing in his basement in his pajamas, who's, you know, maybe finished high school, maybe not. And I don't mean that in an elitist way, but I mean it again as a, 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 a haughtiness about your ignorance, right? Uh, who will write to you and say, uh, basically he's dismissing. I mean, right. So, I mean, imagine all of the unbelievable scientists from many different fields that I've met in my nearly 30 year career as a professor. Every one of those, this guy in his basement has says, has said they're all fake scientists. We, we, we don't know about the issues of falsification in science. We don't know about hypothesis testing. That kind of arrogance frustrates me. And usually when I kind of roll up my sleeves and I then attack in a less than diplomatic way, it's because you've typically triggered me with this. I, I'm just offended by that kind of arrogance. A true scientist, as you well know, Dorian, is someone who is defined by epistemic humility, right? When I yeah. walk into a room and I know something, I walk with the swagger of someone who knows something. But when I don't know something, I walk with as someone who really doesn't know what I'm talking about. So, for example, if you ask me, so what is the what are the pros and cons of legalization of marijuana in Canada since Justin Trudeau, you know, legalized it? I'm going to say, you know what, Dorian, I just haven't done the requisite nomological network to be able to. And I'm, I noticed when I asked you a few questions, you gave that epistemic humility. You said, yeah, I, I just don't know enough. So real scientists know what they know and what they don't know. People on social media know everything. Well, so that's what I was about to ask you. Uh, in what forum are you encountering guys in their basement uh, playing video games? Twitter. In in high school. Yeah. So it possibly it might might be useful to just ignore those <laughs> those comments. Maybe that would be better for, your, you know, your mental health. Can I tell you something? I would yeah. argue what you just said is one of the most profound things that maybe five years in therapy wouldn't get me. Because if I were able to truly internalize and learn that lesson, the amount of emotional and 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 and, and cerebral angst that I would avoid and uh, increase in blood pressure would be truly bewildering. And and, and I've tried and I, I often succeed, but other times I fail. So for example, I currently have this, well, I, it's been a year now. I have these incredible, these the unbelievable neo-Nazis that have been coming after me, defaming me, doing, right? And everybody said, they, my publicist, the publisher, my wife, everybody, colleague, do not pay any. I mean, nobody takes these idiots seriously. They're 
they're they're total schmucks who are trying to ride your coattail. It, it's an insult for you to to even answer them. I get that, but then I come from a deontological perspective, right? I come from a there is right, there is wrong, there is truth, there is falsehood. I cannot tolerate that such a person could exist. But that ends up then sucking your energy because the much smarter thing to do is exactly what you said. Don't read it. Don't pay it. Joe Rogan told me long ago, I once had mentioned something like, oh, you know, I was reading comments in YouTube. He looked at me incredulously. He goes, you read the com? Are you an idiot? Uh, so, so if maybe I could hire you to keep reminding me that I should never read those comments. Well, so have you heard of Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher? Oh, come on. He's my man. Well, so, I mean, what he said in this situation was like, suppose someone calls me bald. It's like if he's he must be correct. So it's not an insult. Just like that's correct. <laughs> suppose someone calls me fat. If someone thinks I'm fat, he's stupid and I should pay any attention to him. Why would I listen to people who are so confused that they would call me fat? So right. So right. As a matter, it's it's I, I love that you mentioned him. Because my next book, um, the book is tentatively titled, maybe they'll, maybe the publisher will change the title. It's called The Recipe for the Good Life. And I specifically refer to Epictetus uh, in, in some of my writings. So as a matter of fact, the more general thing related to that book is, you know, Nassim Talib once told me, I mean, somewhat in a, you know, he was teasing me. He said, I don't know what, you know, why you guys study psychology. Everything that needed to be known about psychology, the ancient Greeks have already <laughs> said it and covered it. And I mean, of course, it's a bit hyperbolic, and of course it's not true. But the more that I read the ancient Greeks, the more I said, God damn, I think Talib might be right. What are we doing? Because every time I thought of some insight that I thought I had, then I would go, oh shit, Seneca said it. Oh shit, Aristotle already covered it. So I'm, you know, so it really is incredible whatever they were drinking in their water to be able to come to all of these unbelievably wise adages without having had the empirical science to support their positions. Well, so, you know, the ancient Greeks and other groups of people were very, very smart, lots of really smart people, and they existed for a long period of time, and they retained this body of knowledge and developed it. And so for things like interpersonal dynamics, that's, you know, there's a lot of wisdom in there, <laughs> but like, obviously they didn't, they couldn't, they didn't have the sort of technological tools we have to do astrophysics, but for things related to what it means to be a human being and you know how to interact with other people. I think they're a great resource. Yeah, so what, you, what you're basically saying is that they, they were constrained by, by methodological constraints. I mean, I mean, if I don't have an electronic microscope, I can't tackle exactly. certain research questions. Yeah, all but right. That let's, mean that they're stupid. Exactly right, exactly right. Okay, let's get down to some woke stuff. So you busted or burst rather uh, into the uh, uh, you know public arena uh, certainly more so than you had when you well why don't you tell us the story and then we can drill into it go ahead well i mean the story kind of starts uh, i guess 5 years ago i started to get upset because I, this whole diversity equity and inclusion thing when i started mm -hmm. on the faculty 10 years ago it was sort of like let's give everyone a fair chance uh, let's make sure we reduce our biases. And if we, uh, you know, if there's a tie, maybe we'll take someone from an underrepresented group. But our goal is, you know, the telos of this university is the production of knowledge. That's the goal. And everything's going to be based on merit and academic excellence. But if we have a bias that's prohibiting us from pursuing academic excellence, we should take care of that. And somehow, Maybe five years ago, it started to change to be much more like, oh, our actual goal is hitting these quotas of different groups. You know, that's a goal that's at least on par and maybe even superior to the goal of academic excellence and the production of knowledge. And so I started to get uncomfortable. I had an increasing number of situations in the university and in the scientific community where that was becoming an issue for me. It started to become an ethical issue because uh, I felt that people were being discriminated against and I was participating in it. And the ones who get discriminated against are Asians in particular and men. Uh, and so that started to bother me. And then in 2019, I started predicting to people the things I was hearing getting said by in, in the public and colleagues made me think we were gonna have violence in our society. So I started saying, we're gonna have violence soon. I'm really worried there's gonna be chaos, there's gonna be hostility, murder, it's gonna be dangerous. And then in 2020, it all happened. Uh, you know, we had a whole summer of riots. 
and then it was followed up by riots from the other side. And and I just felt that it's not something that a middle-aged guy who's a tenured professor should be silent about. It, it's a duty to start saying, we've gone down a wrong path. The assumptions that are being made are, by a lot of people in society are dangerous and incorrect, and we need to rethink uh, what we're doing. And so that's sort of how this happened. And so you, so you had written with uh, Ivan Marinovich, who, yeah. who, by the way, uh, I'm very uh, happy to announce, uh, invited me to the Stanford uh, uh, Classical Liberal uh, Forum to speak uh, in, in 2022. So you, you and him wrote an article published in Newsweek where you were intimating sort of your concerns with some of these issues. And someone found out that you had had this horrible wrong thing episode and therefore deplatformed you from speaking at MIT on your scientific work. Yeah, so it actually started in the fall of 2020. And so what happened then was in an internal department seminar, somebody took what was supposed to be a science talk and used it to sort of talk about Ibram Kendi stuff in the fall of 2020. Yes. I asked to make a response advocating for, uh, you know, equal opportunity and merit based systems. And they told me I couldn't. And so I made a response and posted it on YouTube. And then not really knowing about this kind of stuff, a bunch of people, I got a Twitter pile on and a letter of denunciation and that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the president of the university said, you know, we're not going to punish this guy. He can say whatever he wants. And that was the end of it. But that's how Yvonne heard about me and invited me to this classical liberalism seminar, which is actually great. Somebody, the last speaker at that seminar yesterday called it the Soviet bathroom. So his parents were from... Romania, I think, I forget, maybe it was Czechoslovakia, but they said uh, mm -hmm. uh, under the Soviet system, the only place you could be open was when you're in the bathroom. Yeah. To to someone. And so it's a great, it's a great experience because you go there and it's all invitation only, it's all faculty and people just say whatever they think. Nobody is self-censoring, nothing. And so it's a very liberating experience compared to being on a modern university. So anyway, so I met Yvonne through that, and then we ended up making writing that article. And the article was a criticism of DEI and an arg a proposal of an alternative framework. So we sort of given up on the idea that we're getting rid of all these administrators, but the idea is to maybe uh, rejigger them so that they are doing something that's aligned with the objectives of a university rather than opposed to it. So instead of doing diversity, equity, and inclusion, they could do merit, fairness, and equality. Uh, so we gave them, three, you know, we gave them another trinity. To a, a, another acronym. Yeah, another acronym. That Gat Sad can't organize into the DIE religion. See, you see, you keep saying DEI. You should change that. It's DIE, Diversity, die. Inclusion, Equity, because Great. DIE is where you, meritocracy goes to DIE. Go ahead. Great. But so the, the idea was, you, you know, you would focus on merit, but you wouldn't worry about the outcomes. I mean, it's just the, base, the basic idea of liberalism and, and fairness. So... Uh, that was our argument. And then right after that, so, okay. So, and then the strategy. So what's the strategic element of this? The first time I tried to speak on these issues in my department, I thought I, I wasn't really aware of what had been going on in society. You know, I, I've got my head down. I'm a scientist. I'm doing my stuff. I thought that everybody agreed that we treat everyone equally. And I just had to say to my colleagues, like, oh, we're not actually treating people equally. I've seen people being discriminated against by these programs. And they would all say, oh, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, like we should really rearrange what we're doing. So I tried to frame it for, you know, like in a progressive way and for liberal people to, you know, to say uh, we should be worried about this stuff. So like one thing was I made some slides and one of them was, oh, we say we're really worried about inclusivity, but all these uh, conservative Christian students have told me that they don't feel included on our campus. <laughs> and we say we're worried about diversity, but all of these poor Asian students, you know, from immigrant families are being discriminated against. But it completely backfired. It just was like fodder for attacks on right. me. And so I realized at that point that that was not an effective strategy and that a more effective strategy is to try to speak to alumni in the public. Uh, and, and say like, look, this is what's going on. We need some help because our universities are in rough shape. Uh, and you guys who give money through donations or the public through uh, funding, public funding, you can put conditions on those donations, conditions on that funding that says, look, 
you know, we want our scientists to be doing science. We don't want them to be doing weird fluff stuff. Uh, we want our scientists to be chosen based on merit. You know, it's just like if we're choosing who's going to build a bridge, we want the guy who's going to build the bridge well. We don't want the guy who has the right skin color or yeah. uh, gender or whatever. And so that was that was why we wrote that Newsweek article to try to, you know, be open about it. The other issue is after my first little incident, I had hundreds of people write me, you know, people in the field and say, like students, I'm leaving the field because of this, this, you know, or I agree with you, but I have to be silent because I'm so afraid. And so I also felt like it's important to say this stuff publicly and just, you know, take the consequences. So that's why we did that. But immediately after that, a group of Twitter activists started tweeting around about how they were going to like not invite me to give seminars. They're looking for different ways to ratchet up the pressure. Right. So the way that this works is, you know, if at first they tried to shame me on Twitter and I didn't care what names they called me. Okay, great. So then they write a letter of denunciation uh, that requests that the department keeps me from teaching, keeps me from, uh, uh, so I can't have students working with me and do my research, prevents me from being on department committees, makes me a pariah. You know, they know they can't fire me because I'm tenured, so they want to do all this stuff. Another condition of this letter of denunciation was that every faculty member in the department would be interviewed to determine who had similar views, and then they would all be subjected to training. <laughs> okay, so that didn't work. So then the next step is they try to get people to not work with me. Okay, so that's that has worked. Uh, a lot of people have said they don't want to work with me anymore. Uh, that's a combination of people who are true believers and people who are uh, cowards. Cowards scared of the consequences. Yeah. Uh, they try to get it. So, I mean, one recent incident was the the NSF has these diversity things like everyone else, National Science Foundation, yeah, yeah. I guess, what do you call that, NSERC or something? Uh, we like have that. NSERC and we have SHRC, depending <laughs> if it's natural or social sciences, yeah. Yeah, okay, so basically I, these guys contact me, they wanna do a big research grant for like a few million dollars. You know, I fit really well in their science. It uh, there's It's two men then we like develop this grant a little bit and then they talk to the NSF officer and she says, oh, you can't have the grant unless you have at least one, you can't even apply unless you have at least one woman on the team. So then they start asking women and they went through a couple and both of them were like, oh, we're not gonna work with Dorian Abbott because of you know his views wow. on diversity. So then the guy, you know, the other guys are like, well, sorry, we'd like to work with you, but you know, we can't get the grant with you on it, so you're off. And so these are the types of ways that this pressure is introduced. And, yeah. and so last summer they had this issue with Twitter that they wanted that they wanted to keep me from being able to give seminars, which is another way to put pressure on on me to you know admit that I was wrong and change my mind. And then when I got invited to give this big seminar at MIT, they put this into place. And so immediately a group of students and alumni and people from other universities started saying, like, oh, this guy's terrible. MIT needs to fix this, you know. And and I was invited to give a talk about extrasolar planets. That's all I was gonna talk about. And then I was gonna give a department seminar about uh, the Mercury stuff I was telling you about. Yeah. And so never none of this these issues were ever gonna come up. It was a completely a science visit. And basically the chair of the department within a week canceled the whole thing. And uh, I am going to go to MIT next spring just to give the department seminar. But this large public talk and honor in the field, it's kind of like an award and recognition of the field that just is completely canceled. It's gone. Yeah. And you don't think uh, so. So basically, MIT did not cave to to the pressure of you having become public about what happens. And they didn't care about that. They did well. They didn't uh, reinstitute that lecture. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, if they do, if they invite me to give it next fall, I'll give it. You know. Right. But the, that didn't happen yet. Well, so I, I, I guess number one, uh, thank you for, uh, you know, having gotten out of your lane, and because I, I frankly, I get frustrated when uh, fellow academics say, well, you know, I, I didn't know what was going on. I was busy with my stuff. The reality is, and I don't say this to 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 toot my horn, but and I, you probably know this, Dorian. I've been saying all these things for roughly three decades now, right? And that's what led to eventually me writing the parasitic mind. So I was 
probably the main and only voice for many, many, many years in academia saying, this is exactly what's going to happen. Now, I don't say this because I want to be gleeful about, hey, I told you so. I say it really out of indignation and frustration because it never had to get to this point. Because if all the Dorians of the world, would, and I'm thankful that you finally did come out. So I'm not, this is not meant to castigate anything on you, but to say that, you know, if other people who are listening to this also find their, you know, Damascus moment and kind of speak up, we'll get rid of this garbage very quickly. The problem is to find a way to get the silent majority, most of whom despise this stuff, even within academia, uh, yep. because I, you know, the, the hundreds of emails that you've been receiving since you came out are the emails that I've been receiving on a daily basis for the past 25 years. Right. Yep. But I can't get because what happens is, thank you so much, Dr. Saad, for all that you've done. Please, if you're going to read this letter on your show, don't mention my name. It's yep. in every single letter. So if I can't get you to even have the necessary courage to stand beside me, not I'm not asking you to be the one who speaks out. I'm simply asking you to say, oh, look, Gad Saad is saying this and I stand with him. He supports freedom of expression. He supports the scientific method. He supports reason. He, he supports individual dignity. If I can't get you to proudly stand with that and therefore you have to put that caveat, please don't mention my name then the problem is not going to be resolved. In the small time that you've been in this public battle in the last year or two, do you have a secret recipe to, because you seem to be someone who is thinking strategically, is there a way by which we can compel all of our colleagues who believe in the same things that we do to actually finally find their spines? Well, okay, so yeah, let's talk about that one second before I want to address the stay in lane thing. So. I actually think that I'm staying in my lane. And so one of the duties of a university professor is to help choose the people who will be the future uh, you know, producers of knowledge. So that, that's exactly my lane. <laughs> so I sort of disagree with, with right. the idea that I've gotten out of my lane. But then how to encourage people to speak up. So my strategy right now is to try to encourage alumni and the public yeah. to put pressure because I'm in the, in the university culture that I've observed, I just don't feel like there's, that's going to happen. Yeah. And so the thing is that everyone, well, okay. So there's like certain people who are causing the problem. Like some of the faculty are the problem, so they're not going to solve the problem. Uh, and then most of the faculty they're so interested in the thing that they're working on that they're not going to do anything to disrupt that. And like, that makes sense. How do you become a professor at the university of Chicago, a tenured professor? It's not by worrying about a bunch of things that aren't, you know, whether your laser yeah. works. And yeah. so I'm just not super confident that there's going to be that, that pushback is going to come from faculty. But I, I mean, what I would say is the more people do speak out and there's an increasing number, then the more you know, other people will get inspired to do it. Yeah, there are groups like we've we've got this group heterodox STEM at the Heterodox Academy, uh, where we start an email group where a lot of people have come on that and are willing to write each other emails. You know, right. And so that will start to give people more. Yeah, you know, but I agree with you that uh, you can't only be going. Uh, and, you know, imploring the professors to speak up because as, as I explained in the book, uh, all of the idea pathogens that I document in the book were orig originated from professors, right? I mean, it's, it's yeah, usually, yeah. so, so you're, you're exactly right. Uh, I do agree that by the way, uh, the money angle is when administrators will pay attention. I, I just gave a talk earlier this week at, in San Antonio, uh, uh, in front of a bunch of ultra powerful investment banker types. And uh, the, one of the key takeaways that I gave the, the, the audience members is that, look, you probably all are huge donors to your respective alma maters. If you were to go to your alma mater and say, if you were to deplatform one person for their any ideological position that they've taken, there goes my $25 million, uh, suddenly the administrators are going to be able to start finding their, their spines. So yeah. I, I agree with you that there are uh, ways by which we can intervene outside of imploring the professors to do so that can be quite effective. So I'm with you there. So a couple of things about that. The first is we have to remember you and I that we're lucky, you know, we're in a position where it's actually harder to do real damage to our lives. It's possible, but it's harder. 
And so for a grad student, if a grad student took the kind of positions that you and I have taken, they'd just get squashed. They'd be out of the field. And so when we're encouraging other people to speak up, it's important to focus on tenured faculty who, yeah. you know, it's their duty to not go along with this stuff. The second thing is in terms of uh, how the alumni can be effective, it's not just saying don't deplatform. I think it's important to get real policies in place and ensure that they're being, uh, that they're being respected and enforced. And so we have the Chicago principles for free speech. Yes. The second thing that is often neglected is the Calvin report at the University of Chicago. And so we have a document that says that the university cannot take any position on a social and political issue. And the reason is because it would be a censure of any member of the community who disagrees. And it would be uh, it would enable the other members to try to silence that person. They can say, oh, look, this is our official university position. Okay, so that's super important, and that's been totally violated by universities and institutions across the country over the past two years. I mean, they scientific institutions are acting as if they have to like have an official political position on a, every issue. And then the third thing is we have something called the Shills Report, which says that all hiring and promotion has to be based on merit alone. Now, we don't always respect that, but we have that in place. And so the donors, in, they don't, it'd be good for them not to just say, oh, uh, if you deplatform someone, we'll take our money away. It'd be better for them to say, adopt these specific sure. documents and enforce these specific documents. Yeah. That makes sense. I would say is training, training for students and faculty when they enter the university. A lot of people don't seem to know what academic freedom is and they don't know why it's important. They also associate free speech with conservatives and they hate conservatives. And so they don't even know that this is an issue that is free speech benefits everybody. Of course. And in the past, it actually mostly been people from liberal progressive camps who have benefited most from free speech. And so just some basic education around these issues uh, and what the purpose of a university, you're entering a university, why does this thing exist? It exists to produce knowledge and to convey that knowledge to people. It doesn't exist for any of these other aims. You know, we have other institutions that can accomplish those aims. And so that sort of thing could really help. What is it about? Because I remember, I, I can't remember the name of the, the gentleman. I think he was a dean of undergrads a couple of years ago. He wrote sort of a letter to the incoming class at the University of Chicago. And I, I, I took a quote from that yeah, dean yeah. In, in the parasitic mind. And so there seems to be something unique in the ethos of the University of Chicago that they are at the forefront of you know, trying to be non-woke. Is there some historical context that has allowed the University of Chicago to stand as one of the shining beacons of the non-woke uh, bullshit? So the historical context is, I mean, it's founded late compared to other institutions and very explicitly on the German model, the modern, uh, the modern university model, which is pursuit, you know, pursuit of, sure. truth, you know, production of knowledge. Uh, they took stands early on, like allowing communist speakers to uh, come on campus that were uh, very pro free speech at a time when it was dangerous. And the other thing is one of their big pushes was not to discriminate against Jewish people. And so that's kind of how U Chicago in the mid 20th century got on the map relative to other big universities. They were all putting quotas on Jews for students and faculty and U Chicago didn't which put them at a big competitive advantage. And so they, they've had a long history of, of that. Very interesting. Well, I, I, I don't know if, it's, if I'm allowed to say this, but I mean, I guess it's okay. I was contacted by uh, one of the Freedom Clubs or whatever at uh, Booth at the School of Business at University of Chicago to come to University of Chicago and speak uh, next winter. So if I do, will I need like a massive protection because the dangerous Jewish Nazi will be coming to University of Chicago to speak or... Will it all go smoothly? Can you can you guarantee my safety, Doctor Abbott? No, <laughs> uh, of course not. And if, you know the other issue we've been having at U Chicago is we don't seem to be capable of guaranteeing our students' safety. True, you know, it's a rough neighborhood, and it's gotten a lot rougher. We, you know, we've had some real issues recently. There was a, a a young man who was shot dead. Correct? Is that is that the story you're referring to? Three in the oh, past. Oh, three. Year. Yeah, okay. three in the past year. Yikes. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It's in the South side. That's, that's the, that's the rough area, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And things have gotten a lot rougher. 
uh, over the past two years. So, so, so I, you know, I'm not a criminal justice expert. So, but, but having the uh, the the slogan repeated, defund the police, doesn't actually reduce crime. You know this guy Wilf, Wilfred Riley, or I, I, I think that's his name. You mean Wilfred Riley, who's been on my show? Yeah, uh, yes. Tell me about yeah, him. He, if anyone's interested in that question, I think he's the source to read. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, we share the same publisher because uh, he wrote a book on hoax crimes, kind of the juicy yeah, yeah, Smoye yeah. stuff, and then he's written another book since. And uh, maybe I'll I'll plug my publisher now. Uh, one of the great things about my publishers, kind of like the the University of Chicago of publishers is that Regnery uh, has, has been called sort of a conservative publisher, but the reality is they are the ones who are serving, uh, serving as the bastion of you know, classical liberal values, right? Every single publisher, uh, uh, author who is being uh, silenced with other publishers is finding a home with Regnery. So if any authors have important things to say, you might want to be looking at that publisher. But in terms of whether you will have trouble with the faculty and the students, it, it's hard to say. I hope not, uh, but I can't guarantee it. You know, I can tell you something, uh, and, and I don't, and maybe knock on wood, although this, I'm not sure if this is wood, for the number of positions that I take that should be triggering, you know, I'm pr probably the next most outspoken professor says about a hundred times less things than I do. And yet, while, of course, I receive my fair share of hate and deep block performing attempts and cancellation, it's nowhere near as much as you would expect someone like me to get. And many people have asked me, both off the record and on record, why it is that I'm less you know, susceptible to those kinds of uh, tactics. Now, I think, and maybe you can weigh in if you'd like, uh, I think one... Uh, Maybe I have a personal style where I'm, you know, affable and I joke around, and but it's also based on science. Maybe it's because I've got my victimology poker score that's very high that makes it more. Di oh, you're shaking your head. You've got another explanation. Go for it. The explanation is that uh, you've proven that it won't work. Yeah, they're not going to try that strategy <laughs> on. You know, they're going to try that strategy on the person who just peeks his head up above the wall right, right, and see right. if they can bash yeah, yeah. him down. But once you've lodged a full-scale assault, they know that they're not going to be able to use that strategy on <laughs> too, you. Too, like, too, too big to fail. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Kind of. Yeah, I got and, you. And I think that's an important lesson for uh, everybody to learn is that, especially university presidents, if you make it clear that you're not going to cancel anyone's seminars, they're going to stop asking yeah. to cancel the seminars exactly <laughs> if you make it clear that students who disrupt a seminar are going to be put on probation or expelled they're going to stop disrupting seminars i mean it's pretty simple you just have to make it clear that you're not giving into this stuff got you as we I, I could keep you here for another five hours but i i don't want to be too uh uh, uh harsh on your time uh, are there any projects that you're currently working on that you'd like to use this opportunity to promote? This is your chance. Go for it. Well, no, not really. Not, okay, so let me ask you this then: Is there? Uh, are you now that you've tasted this, tasted this well, I, kind of? I want to promote someone else. Okay, go for it. Uh, there's a really great book called Counter Wokecraft by Charles Pincourt, who is a uh, a pen name of someone a professor who's observed all this stuff happening. And he wrote a book that's sort of a primer for people who don't know about this stuff, what critical social justice, the critical social justice perspective is, what are its tenets, uh, the tactics that are used uh, in order to take over organizations. Mostly it's focused on universities, but it translates, and what the great counter tactics are. And this person has met you uh, and I can put you in contact with him if you'd like. Okay, that'd be great. Uh, is this person tenured? Yes. Why is he or she writing under a pseudonym? Well, you can ask him that. <laughs> okay, well, I look forward to, to meeting it. Counter Wokecraft by oh, Charles. Okay, well, that's very gracious of you to promote a colleague. That's wonderful. Uh, are you planning, last question, are you planning now that you're sort of uh, are weighing in on these important, truly important societal issues that will either help us maintain our universities or watch them wither away. Do you plan on staying in the space or was that your little foray and you're back to your mathematical modeling? Or are you, are you planning to do both? Yeah, I want to do like 80% uh, math stuff and 20% continuing to advocate on this. And the reason is, you know, like 
now people a little bit know my name and so they'll pay attention if I talk about this stuff at least a little bit. And so it's important to keep to keep pushing those positions and not let people forget about them. Uh, and the other issue is I still feel a dude, it's not like the, once the problem is solved, I want to do hundred percent math. I don't like talking to journalists. Uh, I find it annoying and stressful. I don't like doing this kind of stuff, but it's a duty, you know, like we, we have to, people who are in the position to do that advocacy need to do it for at least some of the time. And also, you know, I'm on, I got elected to the university council in the wake of all this stuff. And we're, you know, internally we're meeting with the president and trying to get, uh, gets policies in place and things that we're uncomfortable with at the university improved. And so there's a lot of quiet work that has to get done that takes time. I don't have any articles that I'm thinking of writing right now in particular, uh, but all, all of those things, you know, I'm going to keep doing at least some of the time. Wonderful. Uh, if I do end up uh, being uh, uh, lucky enough to come to the University of Chicago, I hope that we'll get a chance to meet in person. Uh, uh, definitely look me up if you come. That'd be wonderful. And uh, guys, just a quick uh, pr promotional thing. If you enjoy these kinds of conversations, please make sure to support the channel any way that you can. You can go below the description section. There is a icon that says thanks and you could contribute it, contribute there. Dorian, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, entering uh, the battle of ideas in this new way. Uh, we're honored that you've joined the, the group of Honey Badgers and continued success to you. Thanks. Uh, I'll be spending the afternoon whipping myself for not having read the parasitic mind. <laughs> Very well done. Uh, I will end it here, then we'll say goodbye officially offline. Thank you so much, Dorian. Bye.